Zero Bravo, this is 4-1. We are engaging RPG team to the south. Zero Bravo, 2-2. Two, two. Engaging four enemy packs to the north. Zero Bravo, 4-2. Engaging multiple dismounts. It's just past midnight early in the morning of the 24th of March 2003, and the men of the 2nd and 4th troops from C Squadron Royal Scots Dragoon Guards are fighting for their lives. They are defending an intersection known as Grid Point Nick 401 to the north of the city of Basra, the second largest urban centre in Iraq. RPGs and tracer fire whistles through the air while mortar rounds pound C Squadron's position, forcing its vehicles to stay on the move to avoid being bracketed. To the south of the position, two Challenger 2 main battle tanks are holding the Iraqis at bay with their 120mm main guns and 7.62mm machine guns. Troop Sergeant Harry Lamb is commanding callsign 41 when he spots an Iraqi RPG team sprint through the fire and into an abandoned two-storey building. Knowing that the hostile combatants are likely trying to gain elevation in order to hit the Challenger 2's weaker armour on the top of the turret, Sergeant Lamb barks out directions. Hesh round, building front, 100 yards. On, replies his gunner, before Lamb gives the order to fire. The Hesh, or High Explosive Squash Head Round, slams into the building. Almost immediately, another Hesh Round from a second Challenger penetrates the structure and starts a fire. With the target neutralised, Lam and his crew turn their attention back to the Iraqi fighters attempting to encircle his tank. Shortly afterwards, Sergeant Lam spots flashing blue lights coming up the road towards his position. Lam holds his fire and watches in awe as two Iraqi fire trucks arrive and firefighters train their hoses on the burning building where the RPG team had been hiding, oblivious to the fierce battle around them. A quick word on this week's sponsor, War Thunder, a free-to-play military vehicle online combat game. Play with over 50 million players around the world in massive combined arms battles on over 100 major battlefields from the Second World War to the end of the Cold War. Command more than 2,000 accurate real-world vehicles, including tanks, aircraft, helicopters and ships. Thanks to the game's intuitive mouse aim mode, you can fly any aircraft using nothing more than mouse and keyboard, and with their realistic physics and sound models, you can immerse yourself in exciting real-time combat, single-player or with a group of friends. I just picked up this speed demon, the South African Roycat 105. Follow my link to download and play War Thunder for free, with nothing more than a mouse and keyboard on PC, or controller on PS5 and Xbox Series X and S, or the previous console generation. For a limited time only, new players across all platforms, as well as those that haven't played for at least 6 months, can claim a large bonus pack including multiple premium vehicles, premium account, an exclusive 3D decorator for your vehicles, and more. The previous afternoon, an armoured column of 28 Challenger II main battle tanks and 28 Warrior Infantry fighting vehicles from the British 7th Armoured Brigade crossed the intersection of the Euphrates and Tigris rivers in an attempt to isolate Basra. It is the job of the Desert Rats to encircle and isolate the key city of Basra in the southeast of Iraq. American and British forces have captured the Basra airport but the fight for the city itself will be one of the most difficult tasks of the invasion. The Fedayeen have a particularly strong grip on the population in Basra, ruling out any attempt to storm the city. Instead, the British plan is to besiege the Iraqi units hold up inside while creating a humanitarian corridor for civilians to evacuate. The Desert Rats lead the way as the British armoured spearhead continues northeast to cut off the city. Two hours later, the headquarters of the 7th Armoured Brigade receives a disturbing report that Iraqi forces are moving to cut off the column at Nick 104, and issues the order to evacuate the exposed position. Brigade headquarters has received intelligence suggesting that Iraqi special forces will destroy the two bridges over the Kamat Ali Canal, trapping the battle group. The Royal Scots Dragoons hurriedly prepare their 56 vehicles and make a fighting withdrawal back to friendly lines. One of the Challenger 2 commanders radios Captain Ben Catamol and asks, Is this a retreat, boss? To which Catamol answers, Well, it's not a bloody advance, is it? Despite heavy Iraqi fire, all 56 vehicles make it back to base, and the Royal Scots suffer no casualties. This engagement is just the beginning, as the British begin to lay siege to Iraq's second city of 1.5 million people. Also on the 24th, Royal Marine 40 Commando and 29 Royal Artillery 
conduct an artillery raid against an Iraqi armoured brigade. The 105mm field artillery guns are helicoptered into enemy territory, escorted by the Royal Marines to engage Iraqi targets. With the help of US A-10s and FA-18s, 20 Iraqi tanks are knocked out, rendering the brigade combat ineffective before it even got into the fight. By the end of March 24th, British 1st Armoured Division has successfully isolated Basra, where one of Saddam's closest associates, Ali Hassan al-Majid, commands the defence of the city. Al-Majid is better known by his nickname, Chemical Ali, after his use of gas against Saddam's opponent. The British have no intention of fighting an urban battle and instead establish a loose siege along with humanitarian corridors to allow Basra's residents a chance to leave the city. However, Al-Majid orders his forces to shell the corridors on a daily basis, killing and wounding dozens of civilians. Not willing to indiscriminately bomb the city in response, British soldiers can only stay where they are and try to help the wounded. Luckily, the capture of the nearby port of Umm Qasar has ensured a steady stream of supplies to the front. Following their retreat from NIC 104 grid point, C Squadron of the Royal Scots Dragoons is redeployed to the former RAF base at Shaibar Airfield to the west of Basra. For the next two days, the Royal Scots Dragoons reduce enemy resistance in the town of as Zubaya while the siege of Basra continues. On the night of the 26th of March, C Squadron's commanding officer, Major John Bigot, receives a message from 1st Armoured Division headquarters to move out immediately. While trying to clear the rest of the Alfor Peninsula, 40 Commando, led by Lieutenant Colonel Gordon Messenger, is spread dangerously thin, and a column of Iraqi tanks is expected to hit the Royal Marines soon. One tank crewman is roused from his sleep and exclaims, Where are we off to, Blackpool Pleasure Beach? To which his comrade responds, The other side of the Alfor Peninsula, you muppet. Within minutes, the Royal Scots Dragoons have stowed their personal items and set off towards their objective. The operation, codenamed Operation Panzer, will be complicated and risky. C Squadron's column of 14 Challenger 2s, a warrior carrying forward observation officers from the Royal Horse Artillery, two tank repair and recovery vehicles, and an FV-432 armoured personnel carrier to be used as an ambulance, must navigate 50 miles of enemy-held territory at night to reach 40 Commando. Furthermore, the tanks must navigate swampy salt flats and marshland to reach the objective after crossing the hazardous Shat al-Arab waterway. Sea Squadron continues in that direction while midnight comes and goes. The column scans both sides of the road, watching for any enemy ambushes. Just before turning left to begin their journey across the Alfor Peninsula, the tanks stop for one last supply replenishment from the Squadron Quartermaster Sergeant, or SQMS. Fuel, rations and water are distributed to the column, while the night is occasionally lit by the distant battles raging around Basra. One of these battles begins after nightfall, when a massive column of 120 Iraqi armoured vehicles is spotted leaving Basra and heading southeast parallel to the border with Iran, to attack the coalition forces fighting on the Alfor Peninsula. British officers can scarcely believe their eyes, and quickly call up fire missions and air support. As soon as the Iraqis are free of the city limits, a massive Royal Artillery barrage, followed by airstrikes, devastates the column. RAF Harriers and US Navy FA-18 Super Hornets drop precision-guided munitions and cluster bombs, while British 105mm and 155mm AS-90 artillery guns smash Iraqi T-55s and BMPs. The first three vehicles in the column are destroyed, trapping the long tail of armour and artillery in place. In response, the Iraqi convoy scatters as many vehicles move off-road to look for cover from the devastating attack. The bombardment continues as Iraqi tanks seek shelter in palm groves and shut off their engines to avoid showing up on thermal sites. The Royal Artillery send up Phoenix Battlefield Combat Surveillance Drones to seek out and mark the positions of Iraqi tanks. A foreshadowing of conflicts to come over the next 20 years, the drones are used to provide live targeting data to the artillery forces, who continue to rain shells on the Iraqi positions throughout the night. By the following morning, the Iraqi column will be spread out, disjointed, and without any form of organisational cohesion, not that there was a great deal to begin with. 
Meanwhile, just to the south of the city, the Royal Marines of 40 Commando are digging in at their current position. Reports of an enemy armoured attack in the morning of the 27th of March have greatly disturbed Lieutenant Colonel Messenger, who only has five lightly armoured FV-107 Scimitar reconnaissance vehicles to augment his defences. These scimitars would be outnumbered and outgunned even against the Cold War era Iraqi tanks in the area. Inside Basra itself, Chemical Ali decides the best way to draw the British into a fight inside the city is to attack the Royal Marines while they are vulnerable, then pull back to the urban terrain when the British counter-attack. It is imperative that the Royal Scots Dragoons arrive on time to support the Marines. At 3am, C Squadron reaches their designated crossing point over the Shat Al Arab waterway to find a 250 foot wide stretch of fast moving water. Three troop of 23 amphibious engineer squadron from the Royal Engineers have constructed a pontoon ferry to carry each tank across one by one using a German built M3 bridging rig. The M3 is a wheeled vehicle that can act as rafts and be combined to create a floating bridge. Here they are being used as a ferry. Major Bigot leans out of his hatch to speak to one of the lead engineers, asking, so how's this going to work? We're just working that out. This is the first time we have ever done this operationally. Major Bigot responds, well, that makes two of us. We haven't even done one in training. To inject confidence in the rest of his squadron, Bigot decides to cross first. The Challenger 2's driver gingerly guides the tank down a steep embankment and onto the pontoon while Major Bigot offers words of support. Finally, the tank is secured in place and the engineers begin moving it across the Shat Al Arab. The single M3 will be able to move three Challenger 2s per hour across the treacherous waterway. The pontoon reaches the other side and Bigot's tank disembarks as the crew members breathe a sigh of relief. The M3 returns to the west bank and loads the second Challenger to begin the process again. However, the tidal water is beginning to recede, making the embarkation process more difficult. The rest of the tanks embark and cross over while the tidal water continues to be an obstacle. It will take four hours for the entire column to cross over to the east bank and assemble for the final sprint to 40 Commando's position. By now, the first rays of sunlight are beginning to illuminate the barren wasteland of the Al-4 Peninsula when Major Bigot gathers his men for a final briefing. Once they reach the line of departure, C Squadron will split into two groups. The main thrust led by Bigot will advance northeast along a raised pipeline before turning right at an intersection codenamed Taku. The second group, under the command of Captain Catamol, is to move parallel to the first group in order to cover their flank. Both halves of Sea Squadron will then rendezvous at a second intersection named Coriano before moving to relieve 40 Commando. At 8am, the Challenger 2s of Sea Squadron move out from the line of departure and split into two groups of seven tanks each. By coincidence, the line of departure had been codenamed Waterloo by pre-war planners, the battle where the Royal Scots Dragoon's predecessor unit, the Scots Greys, had distinguished itself in 1815. Almost 188 years later, they are once again mounting a charge at a place named Waterloo. A heavy mist descends upon the Al-4 Peninsula as the Challengers thunder forward. Shortly before the column reaches Taku, 155mm AS-90 heavy guns open a deafening barrage on the intersection ahead. One of the rounds strikes an underground oil pipeline, causing a massive orange fireball to erupt from the ground and covering the intersection in dense black smoke. The column slows to a crawl as they approach Taku as visibility gets worse. When Captain Fraser McClemmon's leading Challenger 2 is 200 yards from the objective, the smoke finally clears, and he immediately spots an Iraqi T-55 tank rotating its main gun barrel towards the approaching British armour. He quickly radios a warning, 0, 3, 0 contact tanks, wait out, his Challenger 2 fires a thin armour-piercing round at nearly point-blank range, which penetrates the T-55's frontal armour and exiting through the rear. Within seconds, the stored ammunition detonates and sends the turret flying into the air. Captain McClemmon calmly reports, one T-55 destroyed. Iraqi regular army soldiers and Fedayeen fighters open fire with machine guns, the tracer rounds arcing through the mist and sparking off the Challenger 2's Chobham armour. 
As the rest of the tanks are joining the dual carriageway leading southeast, McClellan's driver spots dozens of anti-tank mines on the road ahead. Blast them off the road with the coax, he shouts. The driver sprays the path ahead with the coaxical machine gun, causing some of the mines to explode while others spin through the air. With McClellan's challenger in the lead, the column slowly advances through the mines while returning fire against the Iraqi defenders. After a few minutes, the road is safe enough for the column to pass through and the advance continues. The seven challengers finally emerge from the dense mist and are faced with a landscape bristling with enemy activity. Iraqi T-55 tanks are positioned hull down facing towards the British column, while MTLB armoured personnel carriers disembark troops to take up position in pre-prepared bunkers. Heavily outnumbered, the British tanks fire at will, while Iraqi mortar rounds bracket the column. Captain Richard Lasseur's Challenger 2 now leads the line of tanks and delegates targets to the rest of the procession. To the north, more Iraqi T-55s which were originally part of the 120 vehicle convoy are appearing in the countryside and fire on the British tanks while black-clad Fedayeen fighters sprint across the palms to rally the Iraqi regulars. Despite the forces arrayed against them, the Royal Scots use their technological superiority to run the gauntlet towards 40 Commando. With the loaders feverishly feeding shells into the breach, the challengers fire round after round to the north, destroying multiple T-55s. Instead of retreating back the way they came, the Iraqi armour scatters off the road and into the countryside, where a steady rain the previous day has turned the sand into a swamp. The bogged down Iraqi vehicles stand no chance against the challengers. Some T-55s manage to score hits on the British tanks, but the Challenger 2's Trobham armour deflects the old T-55's armour-piercing shells. The Challengers continue their rampage, destroying seven more T-55s, six APCs and multiple enemy bunkers. When the first group of Royal Scots reaches the Coriano intersection, they have left a trail of destruction in their wake. Without any infantry or air support, seven Challenger 2s have devastated an eight-mile stretch of heavily defended territory. They are soon joined by the second group, commanded by Captain Catamol, whose men are disappointed in missing out on the action. With C Squadron reunited, the tanks continue until they come across 40 Commando. The tanks pull off to the side, where the Royal Marines cheer their arrival. One of the Marines shouts at Captain Lasseur, What an engagement! We couldn't borrow your vehicles for a few days, could we? With their mission complete, Major Bigot orders his men to catch up on their sleep. Operation Panzer has been a major success. A Royal Scots officer jokes that the battle was like a bicycle against a motor car. Several Iraqi soldiers approach the British to surrender, grateful to not be killed in their failed defence. However, captured Iraqi tank crew reveal the grim reason for their seemingly low odds of success counterattack. Many men were forced into their vehicles at gunpoint by Bath Party loyalists, with threats made against their families and told to do their patriotic duty in fighting off the invaders. It is a telling story of the iron grip that Saddam still maintains over the Iraqi people. The Royal Scots Dragoon Guards will soon be called upon to do battle once more in the ongoing siege of Basra. Follow the link to download this week's sponsor War Thunder, where for a limited time only, new players across all platforms, as well as those that haven't played for at least six months, can claim a large bonus pack including multiple premium vehicles, premium account, an exclusive 3D decorator for your vehicles, and more.